The boys stand up. Males, men, boys, stand up. Next time we come to a word with the letter M, the boys sit down. Okay. When we come to a word that starts with F, the females, the girls stand up. Next time we come to a word that starts with F, the girls sit down. Okay. Can you handle that? How many have never done, the, done this before like this? All of you have? Okay, well then it's your, your pros then, okay? So, and I've, enlist, I've uh, enlisted some help uh, for the girls' side. So, Kendall, do you want to come? For a minute, anyway. <clears throat> I'll hold this one tonight, okay? Because there's really no, not much turning to do. So, all right. I have a friend who really loves me. Ready? Y'all know this one? It's been a while, but it's easy. You'll learn if you don't. Here we go. I have a friend who really loves me. He loves me. He loves me. I have a friend who really loves me. And Jesus is his name. He died upon the cross to save me. Save me. To save me. He died upon the cross to save me. breath from the first one. All right. <clears throat> now it's time to get quiet. Guys, spread out, please, so you're not within talking distance. Guys, scooch, scooch, scooch. All right. This is our lesson time, so it means it's time to listen. Okay, listen to the lesson. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to finish talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Okay? And remember we said the fruit of a tree is evidence of what kind of tree it is? Same thing with the fruit of the Spirit. It tells us whether we are, first of all, whether we're saved, but whether we are allowing the Holy Spirit to, to work in us.
okay, and to lead us in our lives. So let's, let me read the verses one more time. This is Galatians 5.22. Listen, please. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. I'm going to read that one more time. See how many you can say with me. We've tried to repeat these the last few weeks. So let's try, uh, if you can, repeat them with me. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, long-suffering, I'm sorry, meekness, <laughs> and temperance. Okay, those, <clears throat> all right, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, and temperance. So this is the ninth one. Listen. So we've been talking about these, these qualities that will be in evidence in our lives if we're obeying God. If we know him and if we're obeying him. Okay. Now what is temperance? Anybody know what that word might mean just from the sound of it? What is temperance? Anybody know? The word itself, I mean, it doesn't really give us a strong clue necessarily, but it helps us at least relate it a little bit. Temperance. What's your temper? All right, well, that would be included too, but your temper, have any of you ever lost your temper? Have you ever heard that phrase? You get mad, you fly off the handle, right? You yell at somebody, right? And so... That kind of helps us think about what temperance is. Listen, temperance means having restraint. Okay? And uh, oftentimes it's defined as self-control. But that's not really accurate. Okay? Listen, listen, listen. That's not really, it's not really about self-control because, you know, self-control only gets us so far. Okay? We can try to control ourselves... But then sometimes what happens? Something happens and all of a sudden we lose control, right? And so if we're going to have temperance, it's going to require more than self-control. And the Bible is full of examples. Listen, you're awfully squirmy tonight. The Bible is full of examples of individuals who lacked restraint in one way or another in an area of their life. And it always had disastrous results. Let me name just a few, see if you can... Tell me about these or see if we can think about these. What about Eve? Did Eve lack restraint? Remember Eve in the Garden of Eden? What happened as a result of Eve's lack of restraint? They got thrown out of the garden and sin entered into the world when Adam and Eve sinned, right? What about Moses? Some of you have been in Sunday school should be able to think of a story when Moses lost control all right he hit a rock too much <laughs> and understand that God had provided for them by bringing water out of a rock and he told Moses to strike the rock and the first time Moses he struck the rock and water came out the next time Moses struck it twice uh, against what God had said okay um, and he did it I, I'm not sure I don't know why he did it but he, he lacked restraint. He didn't listen to God. The picture there was that Christ was only smitten once. He only died once. And, and so the rock represented Christ. There was a lot there. But just the point is, Moses got angry uh, and uh, he struck the rock twice, disobeying God. And what, what were the results of that? Anybody know? Emmy? Yeah. Death, well, kind of death before... He wasn't allowed to go to the promised land. That was the whole point of his mission, was to lead the children of God into the promised land. And he lost that opportunity. Okay? He led them all the way through those 40 years in the wilderness, put up with so much stuff in the wilderness, uh, but he couldn't, he could only see it. He could look at it, but he could not enter in. Joshua had to take over for him. Why? Because he lost control. Um, Samson lacked restraint. What happened? He married somebody that his parents said it's not good because she was not a Christian. She was not 
uh, in Israel. She was not saved. Okay? She was uh, a pagan, if you, if you know what that word means in scripture, a heathen uh, is a better word. But, uh, and he married her anyway. Uh, and a lot happened as a result of that. Uh, his wife was killed. Uh, the, the, uh, the place was burnt down. Uh, and, and Moses went on the run and he got angry and killed some, some people. And, uh, and Anyway, a lot happened. And then later on he got involved with another person that he shouldn't have gotten involved with. And so he lacked control and there was a lot of fall. And Samson lost his life because of it. God gave him one more chance to be used in the very end. But what more could Samson have done if he would have listened to God in the first place? He could have served Israel for many, many years and delivered them from their enemies. Um, we think of David, others in Scripture who lacked restraint. Okay? And so when we think about this, uh, temperance, as we said, is more than just exercising self-discipline to control our lives. It is actually submission of our will to God's will. It's not so much self-control, it's spirit control. And that's what these fruit represent. Remember, the fruit of the spirit. And so it's about letting the Holy Spirit help us and let him give us the power give us the ability to do what's right even when it's hard okay that is as we said temperance and there's paul talked about and we're going to finish with this but paul talked about there's two laws two two things that that uh, war in our in our minds and our hearts one is the law of the flesh or the law of sin and the other is the law of the spirit now we have laws not just I'm not talking about like the speed limit and all that kind of, but there's laws of nature, they call them, right? There's the law of gravity. What does the law of gravity say or do? I'll try that. What is the law of gravity? The law of gravity says, what? If I let go of this, What's going to happen, Isaiah? It's going to hit the ground. Why? Because of the law of gravity, right? Right? And so what goes up must come down. That's the law of gravity. And so that's true. And we can, I mean, we can try to, in fact, let me, let me find somebody. Um, let's see. I need somebody with a little bit of muscles, Okay. All right, Josh, let's just hand it. Come on, Josh. I want you to hold that straight out, okay? Hold it straight out. Okay. Now, his self-control can hold that bag, right? But what eventually, what eventually is happening, or is going to happen. He needs more than self-control, doesn't he? <laughs> what does he need? He needs another law, something else to counteract the law of gravity. Right? And so, if I do this, wow. Now, I can only do that for so long, too. Okay. <laughs> but the point is, the law of gravity says what goes up must come down, unless there's another law that prevents that from happening. And there's big names for those laws and things, Newton's and all that, Newton's laws and all that sort of stuff. But, but the point is, the law of sin is just going to drag us down. Unless there's another law that, that prevents that from happening. And so that is what the Bible calls, Paul calls the law of the spirit. And so that's what we're talking about, spirit control. Now how do we, just final question here, how do we get the power of the spirit to do what's right? How do we get his strength to help us do what's right. Practically, what, what, how do we do that? Stephen? Okay, what was the first thing you said? Okay, get saved. That's a very good point. First of all, we have to have the Spirit. We have to be saved. And then secondly, he said, pray. That helps give us the strength of the Spirit. What else? Anything else? Yeah, all right, we're going backwards. Okay, Colin, read your Bible, okay? 
and obey your Bible, but read it. It's the first step. <laughs> Pray every day. That was mentioned. Okay. It has to do with putting in our mind, in our heart, those spirit-filled things rather than the, the worldly things. Okay. And so that's to, in order to have temperance, in order to have these uh, fruit of the spirit, we need to be filling our minds with good things. And by that I mean the things of God, the things of the word of God, the things of the spirit of God, and so forth. And so temperance is another indication that number one, you're saved, but number two, that you are filled with the spirit. You're being controlled by the spirit. So it's about obedience. Okay? Uh, temperance is about obedience, but he's the one who helps us obey. We can only do it so long on our own. Right? And then it's going to drop. So we need a more powerful law to counteract that. So, All right. Let's have the preschoolers through second grade. I'll get it before the year's out. Okay. Preschool, preschool through second grade. You may go to games. Don't run, don't run. Go, go, go. Third and fourth graders, go to your class, third and fourth graders. Fifth and sixth graders, go to your class at the end of the end of the hall. You guys need to learn some words. for you to listen. Teens, you may go to your class. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 23. Hopefully you're not quite as wound up as the kids. Leviticus 23. We've been looking on Wednesday night. Well, first of all, quick praises, just real quick. Not going to take long, but. Yeah. The month's going by pretty fast. October went through, flew by, and November's flying by. Thanksgiving is in two weeks. Two weeks from tomorrow, so.
right, Wednesday nights we've been looking and answering the question, how did Jesus fulfill the meanings of the Jewish feasts? We know he fulfilled all the other aspects of the law, and so including the feasts. And the Hebrew word for feast, just quick review, literally means appointed times. God is the one who appointed these, not only feasts, but the timing of these feasts, the order of these feasts. And as we see them fulfilled, as we've been following, following them along, we see that they point again to a beautiful picture of what God has done for us and the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. Again, not just the event, not just the feast, but the, the, even the order of them. He, he uh, prescribed these or he, uh, what's the word I use? Appointed these times, planned them, orchestrated them uh, to reveal to us a special story. So they're more than a historical remembrance. That's what they were based on in, in Israel's history. Uh, but it goes far beyond that. There's great significance prophetically uh, as well, demonstrating the work of redemption through Christ. And so in our series, we've been looking at the historical event, first of all, and then we look forward to the fulfillment of each in Christ. So far, we talked about Passover, which is a remembrance and a fulfillment of what? Passover. But what specifically? Our redemption, right? The blood, okay? Uh, and our salvation. Uh, then we talked about <clears throat> uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, it has to do with purity. Remember about the, the leaven and, and all of that unleaven, leaven representing sin. Uh, the feast of the first fruits, uh, we looked at as well. Um, and so all of those feasts kind of overlapped each other. They were all kind of right together. Uh, the unleavened bread started the day after Passover. The feast of the first fruits started on the first day of unleavened bread. Uh, <coughs> sorry about that. <coughs> and so we looked at the significance of that as well. Tonight we're going to go to the next one, and that is the fourth feast. And that is the Feast of Pentecost. The Feast of Pentecost, or sometimes referred to as the Feast of Weeks. Here in Leviticus 23, in our listing of feasts, and then we'll look at the uh, event and then the fulfillment. Verse 15, he says, You shall count unto you from the morrow after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be complete. So after the Feast of first fruits, seven Sabbaths. In other words, seven weeks, right? Uh, in other words, what? 49 days. 7 times 7 is 49, right? I wasn't that good at math, but I know that one. So 49 days. And then he says, even unto the morrow after the seventh Sabbath. So on the, what, 50th day. And uh, the word Pentecost, that's exactly what it means, 50th. Okay? Penta is, is 5, or pent is 5, but the pen, uh, Pentecost, 50th. So verse 16, in the morrow after the seventh Sabbath shall ye number 50 days, and ye shall offer a... What's that next word? New meat offering unto the Lord. That's a key word when we talk about this Feast of Pentecost. You shall bring out of your habitations two wave loaves of two-tenths deals, and they shall be of fine flour. They shall be bacon with leaven. They are the first fruits unto the Lord. And you shall offer with the bread seven lambs without blemish of the first year, and one young bullock, and two rams, and they shall be for a burnt offering unto the Lord with their meat offering and their drink offerings, even an offering made by fire of sweet savor unto the Lord. Then you shall sacrifice one kid of the goats for a sin offering, and two lambs of the first year for a sacrifice of peace offerings. And the priests shall wave them with bread, the bread of the first fruits for a wave offering before the Lord with two lambs, the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. Uh, verse 21, ye shall proclaim on the selfsame day that it may be a holy convocation unto you. Ye shall do no servile work therein. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. And then verse 22, notice, and when you reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of the harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. <clears throat> Who are the stranger? What's, what's that mean when it says, uh, it says to the poor, but then to the stranger? Gentiles, right. Uh, Non-Jewish, okay. Uh, Gentiles. So he says when you reap, he says leave the corners of the field, don't clean it completely. Leave some there for the poor and for the Gentiles, for the strangers. So there's a principle here. But first, the event. 
Okay, we, we talk about Pentecost, and we always think, and we're going to turn there in just a moment. In fact, you can go and turn if you'd like to now. But Acts chapter 2, hold your place here in Leviticus, because we'll come back. But we hear the word Pentecost, and we always think about Acts chapter 2, right? Uh, the, the coming of the Holy Spirit and Pentecost. But we realize, because we just read it, that wasn't the first Pentecost. They had celebrated Pentecost every year since God laid out that feast for them after they uh, again left Egypt and, 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 uh, and, and uh, got in the promised land and all that. He, he gave them these feasts, uh, the feast of Pentecost. And so in Acts 2, it wasn't the first Pentecost. Uh, it was, now they still celebrate Pentecost today, but quite literally, quite frankly, Acts chapter 2 is, is the last Pentecost uh, because Christ fulfilled uh, these things. We'll look at it in just a moment here. Uh, but uh, uh, Pentecost was a time of thanksgiving for the harvest. Now there was first fruits, okay, that was for uh, certain aspects of the harvest, the barley harvest, and, and some, but, but here uh, he's talking about a, a, a greater or more general thanksgiving for the blessings of harvest. And so it was not only a reminder of God's blessings to them, but was also used by God, as we just saw there in Leviticus, it was used by God to provide for strangers, provide for, for uh, the Gentiles. So it wasn't just for the Jews. It was actually a time of blessing for, for everybody, okay, for the Gentiles as well. <clears throat> all right, so what about the fulfillment here in Acts chapter 2? We won't read all of this. I know you're familiar with, uh, with, uh, with the, the events of that day, uh, what Scripture tells us. Let's just read the first four verses of Acts chapter 2. It says, when, they, when the day of Pentecost <clears throat> was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And again, Christ on the cross, he died on Passover. He was raised on Feast of Unleavened Bread. Uh, and here at Pentecost, now something else is going to happen. Uh, and so suddenly there came a sound, verse 2, from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So 50 days following the resurrection of Christ, following the feast of first fruits, the day of Pentecost came. And this day of Pentecost was the birth of the New Testament church. When the Holy Spirit came to indwell and empower the church of, of God, uh, the New Testament church. And so as a result today, what happened? When as soon as a, a, someone becomes a believer, as soon as they believe on Christ and accept him as Savior, what happens? as a result of Pentecost. They're indwelt by the Holy Spirit. He, come and he comes and abides within, not just upon, as he had done prior to these days, uh, prior to Acts 2, but he abides within. Uh, we are baptized. The Bible says we're baptized in the Spirit. Now, again, that term I know is misused by others to promote other things, but being baptized in the Spirit just means we have received Christ. We are now, we've been born again. We've been washed by the blood. We've been... Uh, the wash of regeneration the Bible talks about, but we've been born of the Spirit, okay, uh, immersed in the Spirit, so he indwells us the moment that we believe on him and, and accept him by faith. Uh, but also remember back in Leviticus, um, it said that this was a new offering, a new meat offering it was referred to. And so something new happened here in Acts chapter 2, right? Pentecost. Uh, something new happened. God didn't change his plan. He was fulfilling his plan, but it was something new to those who were here and present on this day and in regard to the church, as we talked about. The main characteristic of the church age, which separates it from all other ages, before and after, by the way, when the church is taken out, uh, before the tribulation period, uh, it's going to be an end to this indwelling that we've been talking about. Um, I think the indication is going to go back to more of an Old Testament power of the Spirit upon men, but, but the Holy Spirit goes with us. Scripture tells us that. Okay? Uh, and so, but it was a new thing. The main characteristic of the church age, which separates us from all other ages, is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Remember Jesus, and I have the verse here, we don't need to turn there necessarily, but John 14, 17, when Jesus said, uh, I, I have to go, uh, but he was trying to encourage them and say, but don't worry. Obviously I'm paraphrasing, I'm going to turn their reading, but uh, he says, but, uh, you know, I, I'm going, but he said, I'm going to send somebody else. I'm going to send another comforter, somebody who will not just be with you as I have been with you, but someone who will be what? 
in you, literally, in you. Uh, he shall be in you. So that's, the, that's what distinguishes the church age from all ages before and all ages after is this indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He shall be in you. In fact, the, the Bible says our bodies are what? Anybody remember what, think what I'm thinking of? Our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> he abides within us. Uh, and so, and that ought to make us think as well, shouldn't it? By the, every day of our lives, if we, if we actually think about that. The temple was a holy place. Uh, the temple could not be defiled. The priests, before they could even enter the temple to do service in the temple, what did they have to do? They had to cleanse themselves. They had to, they had to offer sacrifice. They had to go through all these things just in order to enter the temple to serve God. We are the temple. And so God forbid that we should defile the very dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. But we do that, don't we? Probably on a daily basis. Uh, but it, it should give us pause to think about that. We take the temple everywhere we go. And it's meant to be a holy place, an undefiled place. Well, anyway, he says, uh, <clears throat> it's a new thing. Acts chapter 2, Pentecost was a new thing. <laughs> it never happened before. And can distinguish us from all other ages before and after. But there's something else that we touched on. Uh, again, remember in Levit Leviticus there that God said, in fact, <clears throat> let me just read real quick again. I know we, we already mentioned this a couple of times. But uh, verse number 22 where it said, Thou shalt <clears throat> gap, not gather any gleaning of thy harvest. I'm sorry, let me start at the beginning of the verse. When ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest. Neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. And then he says, I am the Lord thy God. I suppose just emphasizing, listen. <laughs> listen and do as I say. Uh, but so in Leviticus, God used Israel's harvest to provide for the poor and for the Gentiles, the strangers. Now, God told Abraham in Genesis, what chapter? 12, was it? Was that the first one or the 15? Well, my mind just went uh, kaplooey, but... I think it was 12, right? Where, well, that's where he called him out. But he gave him, I think, the initial promise there, didn't he? That says, uh, through your seed shall all the nations be blessed, all the world be blessed. Uh, and he was, in thy seed, here I have the quote, I didn't write the reference, but in thy seed shall all the nations of the world be blessed. He was talking about the coming of Christ through the seed of Abraham. But in him all the nations of the world would be blessed. That's what Pentecost in Acts chapter 2 is all about, okay? Uh, that now the gospel has officially been opened to who? To the whole world, to the poor, to the strangers, that is to those who are not part of Israel, uh, who are God's chosen people. God gave them the sacrifices, the priesthood, and, and all these ways that they could please him and have a relationship with him that he didn't do for other nations. Now, again, there were some Gentiles saved in the Old Testament because of the witness of, of, of some uh, Israelites, <clears throat> Uh, but they were his people. And salvation, <clears throat> excuse me, the provision was for them. But now, Pentecost, something new happened. And he allowed, what, this to be a blessing to all, to the Gentiles, to the, uh, to, to the rest of the world. Um, Galatians chapter 3. Let's just look at two more places and then we'll wrap up here. Galatians 3 Hoping that's the verse I want uh, that tells us about that. In Galatians 3, verse 22. Okay, this is talking about the law and, and the... Uh, yeah, so let's read verse 22. It says, but this is Galatians 3, 22. Excuse me. But the scripture hath concluded all under sin, that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up under the faith which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith. But after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. The purpose of the law was to point them uh, to Christ. Um, verse 26, for ye are all the children of God by what? Faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek or Gentile. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Jesus Christ. 
Okay, that's the significance of Acts chapter 2, Pentecost. Uh, that now there's no distinction. Uh, all who are in Christ, as verse 27 says, are baptized into Christ, all have put on Christ. And we are, verse 28 says, we're one in Christ Jesus. And so, doesn't matter. There's no, again, no one has, uh, and this is, was the, the Jews' problem, uh, in Jesus' day at least, they thought they had uh, a leg up on everybody else. And again, God gave them special privileges, but now he says nobody has a, <clears throat> nobody has a leg up <clears throat> in this matter of, of a pleasing God or a matter of, of being redeemed or, or saved or having a relationship with God. So Pentecost pointed to the great harvest of souls and the gift of the Holy Spirit for both Jew and Gentile who would be brought into the kingdom of God during that church age. So the indwelling of the Holy Spirit signified the gathering together of one body into Christ. Uh, we were allowed to participate uh, in, the, in the harvest there. And so again, no one has an upper hand or special privilege when it comes to salvation. Uh, I don't care who your parents were, who your grandparents were. I don't care what your nationality is or any other thing. Uh, all must come to him the same way. You've heard me say this over and over and over and over again. All must come to him as sinners in need of a Savior. That's it. So it was... Uh, we said it was a new thing. We said it was used to share the blessings of harvest and, and the fulfillment we see. One more thing and we're done. It was an anticipation of what was to come. It was celebrated after what was the last feast. It was the feast of first fruits that represented the resurrection, right? He became the first fruit of them that slept and we looked at that last week. And so Pentecost came after the resurrection. He became the first fruits. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, and then we'll be done, just in that very next book. <clears throat> I remember when I first uh, came here as pastor, that chairman would go by right invitation time every Sunday. I mean, just write it. I don't know how it knew when we were closing, but, <laughs> but and uh, sometimes you have to stop because, you know, it's the noise, but of course then people always look out the window, you know, I don't know how people are, but anyway, <laughs> so, um, so now they found us on Wednesday night, but that's okay. Um, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14, we'll close, he says, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, we talked about the earnest of the harvest, earnest of... Uh, on Sunday morning as well as last week on, on the Feast of First Fruits, the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of glory. And so Christ's resurrection and the guarantee that the rest of the harvest would soon follow uh, is also seen in this thing of Pentecost, this, this event. Uh, it's, it's an anticipation. It, it, it talks about the, the, the harvest, including uh, the entire harvest, sharing the blessing of the harvest. But it also helps us look forward. He not only came to indwell us, but he came to seal us. Until when? Verse 14, I think it is. Until the redemption of the purchased possession. Until uh, God uh, claims us at, uh, in person. That's as, as when we get to heaven. That's what it's talking about. Uh, when that is complete. But, all right, so that was Pentecost. And uh, we'll move on. Next week, the next one, but it's just going to continue to, to carry on. Um, but these were really the, the key feasts. I mean, the others are as well, but uh, it just pictures what Christ has done for us, what he's doing for us, and what he will do for us in these first four feasts. Any comments or questions or contemplations? Or <clears throat> All right, if not, we'll look at our prayer